Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming in today. And uh, welcome also to our online audience, at least one or two people joining online. Um, great that you could make it. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, been to our, well, it's not so new anymore, but it's a newish office. We used to be over in uh, on Westminster Bridge Road. Let me do a couple of bits of um, housekeeping. So, um, Toilets, as you came in uh, to reception, they are just over there, just in front of the, of the reception. Uh, you can't make your way up onto any of the other floors without a, a key pass, so uh, uh, you're, you're, you're barred, you're, you're stuck here for the day. No disappearing at lunchtime, okay? Um, and if the fire alarm goes off, it sounds like a fire alarm, then we go out through that exit or we go out through that exit. So that's, 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 the, that's the tedious stuff. So World War Today. Well, l let me, actually, let me, let me start by just introducing ourselves. Um, I'm Roger Kahlo. I'm head of the Water Policy Programme here at ODI. You and can I'm Alan Nicholl, and I'm Programme Director for the Global Water Initiative East Africa. So excellent. So World War Today, which I learned bizarrely in, in uh, DFID, Department for International Development, yesterday is sandwiched between International Day of the Sparrow and um, something uh, equally um, esoteric. But uh, World War Today, it is. Uh, the theme, actually, of World War Today is uh, water and energy. Uh, so in the usual tradition here, we will completely ignore that theme and do something else. And that something else, um, as you'll see, as you will have seen, is, is this topic from ground to growth about Africa's groundwater potential and the potential for uh, development for agriculture. Um, that's the, that's the, the kind of topic for, for today. Um, so basic questions, you know, how much, where, um, how could it be developed, what are the barriers, what are the opportunities? What about the distribution of costs and benefits? Uh, will we see the benefits skewed disproportionately to vested interests, or will we see it be exploited in a reasonably democratic manner? So as these are some of the, the big questions I think we can, we can address during today. Let me quickly go through the program. Um, as always, when we have people joining by VC, um, of varying uh, quality. There is always opportunity for comical mishap. It may look comical to you, it won't be comical to me. We have a very good technical team. We've got Robert at the back there and we're obviously used to doing this kind of thing, but something usually comes up. So if we have uh, a couple of glitches with our connections and people drop in, drop out, bear with us, okay? Be, be patient. So quickly going through the program, um, a couple of late changes. You will have noticed that the program did uh, change a wee bit um, over the course of, of last week. So uh, we're still kicking off with um, Alan McDonald on the resource side. And then we're going to run um, the minister's speech. So this is Atto Sileshi, the uh, state minister for agriculture in Ethiopia. Sadly, uh, he's not here. Um, but that was a, a, a pre-recorded interview that um, Alan and his colleagues did um, earlier in the week. And then we'll take a break. Um, and then um, uh, Bruce uh, Langford will step in for Hezron Mugaka, as often is the case with such events. We struggle getting, getting visas um, out of the Nairobi office. So sadly, Hezron can't be with us, but um, I'm delighted that Bruce has been able to step in. Then we'll switch over to Karen Vilhoff in, in IMI and, and, and then get some good discussion going. We also have this book launch today from UEA, University of East Anglia Water Security uh, Centre, uh, which is why they are co-hosting as well, along with GWI and, and ODI. So we'll, we'll get some little pitches there from the authors. And then the afternoon session, I think, we'll, we can focus a little bit on the parallels, the comparisons between Asia and Africa. So we have somebody dialing in from, from India and some, um, um, some um, experts who can talk eloquently about the similarities and differences. And then we shift to the another 
another discussion and not not forgetting the sort of uh, the, the sort of informal book launch at the end of the day where we've um, over ordered on the wine I think um, so do 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 I shouldn't be telling you that should I um, but uh, do do hang around if you can so that's it from me I'm just going to pass over to uh, Alan because I know he wants to say a few words about um, GWI and you've got a couple of slides thank you very much Roger and uh Welcome on behalf of GWI East Africa. I think we have a fantastic audience here. I'm really going to just kick off with some opening thoughts. Nothing particularly sophisticated, but I hope something to try and get the um, thinking juices going first thing in the morning. I, I'm not sure I'll be able to see my presentation, but I'll give it a go. There you go. Right. OK, so um, why GWI? I just wanted to explain quickly what we are. It's um, funded by the... Howard G. Buffett Foundation. It's a five-year action research program on water for agriculture. There are three regions of the world we're wor working in, Central America, West Africa, and East Africa. And this meeting is being co-hosted by the East Africa part of uh, GWI. We're really about action research. And through action, action research with farmers, with local officials, with um, the research community in East Africa, trying to explore options for managing water more effectively in agriculture. And one of those options, and it keeps on popping up <coughs> when we work with farmers, is accessing groundwater, finding ways and means of accessing groundwater, particularly as a buffer in years of poor rainfall, and also as an opportunity perhaps to extend the growing season or the capacity to grow certain crops during the dry season when traditionally agricultural production is harder. So. For us, this meeting is really an essential part of understanding the whole, the wider picture, if you like, of the role groundwater can play in, in the critical agricultural sector in East Africa. And we focus particularly on Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Uganda. We're also trying, and I think this is an important point for the meeting as well, to engage politically. It's a policy issue in East Africa, and it's becoming a, a, a more critical policy issue, really, as groundwater becomes more accessible um, and that is largely to do with the change in the nature of technology in East Africa and the affordability of technology, making groundwater, particularly shallow aquifers, much more abstractable. So in a sense, you know, this part of Africa is a few years behind other parts of the world, but learning from those experiences in, in India and China are really very important things to do. Political engagement, evidence, generating research output with farmers in the region, and then trying to find ways of turning the knowledge that is there, and not just through GWI, but many other institutions, into useful investment materials. So how can you advise people on what to invest in and how at different levels? Local engagement is part of what we're doing, but also national level policy influencing. So one of the reasons we, um, we have Atu Seleshi talking to us is because he's very interested in how research in the region can help inform uh, the Ethiopian government going forward and developing its uh, household irrigation program. So again, through all these kind of avenues, we're, we're hoping with partners and those at different levels in East Africa to really kind of leverage some change in investment levels, including um, over groundwater ab abstraction. So one idea. Just thought I'd throw a few colors onto the screen to get us kicked off. Blue water, surface flows groundwater. Classically, an easy option to try and abstract, access, and use more blue water in agriculture. Alongside blue water, the green water debates, the soil water, the rainwater, the water that's used in the plant production system in the soil profile. Essentially, in a way, particularly in East Africa, there are two almost separate communities surrounding these two types of water. And what we're trying to do in GWI, and I think many others are trying to, to bridge these two communities and understand how we can develop something like a water smart agriculture, where combining green water, combining groundwater, combining other sources of surface flows can really help produce a more sustainable approach to water management in, ag in agriculture. And particularly in East Africa, a range of issues, conjunctive use, the combined soil and water management challenges, the new technologies, the pump technologies, the abstraction, sustainable abstraction of shallow groundwater as well. 
are critical issues in managing the whole water picture, so avoiding the negatives that may affect uh, domestic supplies, for example. Critical to that is resource knowledge and understanding what is in the ground. Uh, one of the, the clear issues in Ethiopia, for example, is lack of understanding of the hydrogeology beyond the very broad scale. So building that picture, that detailed picture, we'll hear a lot about that today, I'm sure, is a very critical thing to do. But also farmer-led governance. So building the link between the knowledge of the resource in the ground and those people who use it is also very important. I just want to finish by showing you three of our champion farmers. This is Muchit, who works, who lives and works in uh, Darawarada, South Gonda. And those are her words. She is desperately trying to access groundwater. She's finding it very difficult. But increasingly in South Gonda, around Lake Tana and Bahida, pump technology, diesel pumps, are becoming affordable. So what happens when these farmers are in a community of farmers who can then afford to abstract large amounts of water? No, there are critical governance issues surrounding how the, the resource is managed in these kinds of circumstances. In Sami district in Tanzania, we also work with champion farmers, and these are people who are helping work through the action research process, identifying technologies and practices to try and uh, abstract water or to use water in the soil, the soil profile, the green water more effectively. Again, you know, here, surface water related irrigation, but still a real interest, uh, a concern, a wish to invest in, in irrigation. So, questions arising. What kind of farmer extension services should be supported? How can these services help direct farmers to, towards the least risky kinds of um, water abstraction, water access issues? And finally, Lily is in northern Uganda, where again there's available groundwater. And I'm sure there are people in the room who know how much and how easily it is to, to abstract that groundwater, but how to manage that within the wider farming system, the wider market system for, for produce. Right now, the north of Uganda is severely affected by conflict in South Sudan. So the market for produce has shrunk significantly, affecting the demand on the resource, affecting the kinds of investments farmers want to make. So I just wanted to throw those up there and some final kind of questions to kick off. So did the race to the bottom we've seen elsewhere in the world yield tangible results in terms of growth and development? Was there a ground to growth relationship in India? Was it sustainable? And what were the main drivers of the abstraction? And I think there is a link to energy and water because at least in parts of India, it was the very, very affordable energy that enabled the abstraction of large amounts of water. So in a sense, there's a very important link here between the energy, water, and the food nexus. And I think we're going to learn some very interesting things today from different parts of the world. And I'm hoping that we can relate these then back to, to the African experience. What can unlock access in sub-Saharan Africa without leading to over-exploitation? So how can policy changes be made? How can assistance, technical assistance, how can extension services really help to unlock the resource? And we'll hear about the availability of the resource, the challenges finding ways of accessing it sustainably? How can the risks be mitigated? And how can mistakes be avoided? Finally, back to this water smart agriculture idea. You know, is there something like a blue-green revolution developing? Is there a change? Is there a, a tipping point in East Africa and other parts of Africa? Because from our experience at the moment, things are changing very fast. So is there an opportunity here to really help the change go in a positive direction and avoid the, the negatives and, and the pitfalls of uh, other parts of the world. Roger, over to you. Yep, thanks, Alan. Um, I think without uh, further ado, um, we're going to go um, straight into our first keynote. And what we're doing here is running through a list of um, a list of themes um, and the logical place to start. Um, I think is is to take a look at at the resources or to deal with the resource perspective. Um, the program um, text makes tantalizing reference to some work that was done 
um, around 12 months ago, um, which did hit the international headlines, as we shall hear. African agriculture, so the story went, sits atop a vast reserve of untapped water that could fuel a green revolution. Okay, that was not actually the conclusion of the scientists. That was the spin given in the headlines that were spread across um, the international media. So, you know, I think it's good to go back and re-examine where that story came from. And um, I'm delighted to welcome um, Professor Alan MacDonald, who was the um, lead author of the paper, which kicked off that, uh, that little bit of uh, media frenzy. Uh, we have another of the authors here, um, uh, Richard Taylor, um, who will be speaking later this afternoon. But first, um, uh, Alan, on the resource perspective, thanks for coming. Thanks very much, Roger. I'll just uh, put the presentation up, I think. Yeah, you can see it over there. Okay, yeah, that should be me. I can't, uh, is that how we're going to go with that? We need yeah. our glasses. We do need yeah. our glasses, <laughs> we're getting old, don't we? <laughs> Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here today and to, to talk to you a little bit about the, the groundwater resources in Africa. And uh, as Roger said, uh, about uh, 18 months or so ago, there was a lot of headlines in the media about these massive groundwater resources in Africa. I put a few of the, the headlines up there on the, on the screen. Loads of water, lots of reserves, uh, huge water resources in the BBC. There's one of these articles just tucked in the top right there from New Civil Engineer, which was the only one that picked up the caveats and said, careful now, careful as you abstract the groundwater in Africa, it might not be sustainable. That was the only one that picked up the caveats. But anyway, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the story behind these headlines, talk you through the groundwater resources off Africa and how sustainable they might be, and maybe discuss a little bit some pointers for managing these groundwater resources in the future. So this is really the story behind these headlines. So I began to get interested in creating these uh, maps, these quantitative maps of groundwater in Africa because of other maps that were produced for the world. The maps I've shown you there are of global water stress and very famous maps put together by Chris Boris Marty and his team uh, about global water stress. And there's a map with the red and yellow colours more water stressed and the blue areas less water stressed. And this was, the map I'm showing you at the moment is the natural figure. And then if you put management on top of it, how you manage water, then you see that uh, America and Europe turns blue again because we have lots of water storage, but Africa turns very red and yellow. And these maps began to, uh, lots of discussion about how to increase water storage in Africa. If we're going to make people more water secure, we need an awful lot more water storage. Maybe we need a lot more dams to make Africa more water secure. And I got a little bit upset by this because it ignored the groundwater resources. So it was these maps that spurred us on to try and develop the, the forgotten part of this picture. I've just put up a, a two photographs there of, uh, of river flows in, that's in Nigeria showing the, the great variation in surface water, which led to these water stress maps. But groundwater is different. And if we look deeper, then there are a lot of groundwater resources. A lot of other water resources are not accounted for in these global water stress maps. And since I'm from the British Geological Survey, I put, put up five pictures of different types of rock just to show you the variation in geology that you get, which controls how much groundwater is is available. We've got mudstones, sandstones, uh, we've got a, a nice, which is one in the middle, and then at the bottom we've got a, a, an organ nice as well. Geology is beautiful, and a, a, it's, it's a wonderful subject to study. <laughs> but these are the rocks that are under the ground and are controlling the amount of groundwater that, that might be available. And the thing is that we actually know quite a lot about how to develop these groundwater resources. How to uh, find suitable sites for boreholes and wells using here's geophysics or maps or other sorts of knowledge. 
of how to drill uh, boreholes that will be sustainable, uh, that will find the groundwater resources, and of, of doing the tests on these uh, water resources to find out how much water you can pump out sustainably, to examine the water chemistry. We, we know an awful lot as hydrogeologists of how to actually develop these groundwater resources. And there's, there's countless numbers of, of textbooks and manuals on how to, to drill uh, and exploit groundwater sustainably. So we know quite a lot about them. So what we did in our team, uh, and this team uh, involved uh, UCL and ODI and our, ourselves and was funded by DFID, was to try and produce the first quantitative maps of groundwater across Africa. So we started off with our geological maps and we created a detailed geological map at a continental scale. We got together lots of other information on hydrogeology, so all the available maps that we could find that had already been done by countless hydrogeologists across the continent. And lots of different studies, uh, individual papers and studies uh, and detailed resource assessments done over the years. We gathered all that information together uh, along with case studies in, in West Africa, East Africa, uh, lots of case studies to produce our maps, our quantitative maps. And this is what we found. The volume of groundwater storage across Africa is actually huge. These figures of 0.5 to 1 million cubic kilometres, our estimates, are roughly 30 times the amount of water stored in the lakes and rivers of Africa. So there are huge volumes of groundwater stored within Africa, so we estimate. From the maps you can see these are dominated by the North African basins, where not many people live, the Nubian sandstones and other sandstones under, under the Sahara, so there's lots of groundwater resources there but not really in a useful place for abstraction. But actually, even when you look elsewhere at the lighter blue areas on the map where there isn't a lot of as much groundwater storage, but even there, there's possibly enough storage surrounding uh, hand pumps and wells to, to store maybe 10 years worth of, uh, of groundwater that might be used by a hand pump. So actually, there are, is quite a lot of volume of groundwater storage across Africa. However, accessing that groundwater is, might not be particularly straightforward because when you look at the geology, uh, you realise that you won't get a huge amount of groundwater out of an individual borehole across the whole of the continent. The yellow and the green areas of that map are places where you're unlikely to be able to drill a borehole to sustain a pivot irrigator or a large-scale irrigation. It's only where the, the geology is very permeable in sandstones and these at this continental scale that's the blue bits of the map there it's only there where you might be able to sustain pivot irrigators now of course this is a you know it's more or less a cartoon these maps you know, at a <coughs> continental scale when you zoom into a country you'll find that these these uh, sandstones or sands and gravels are prevalent in some of these areas that, that look yellow and green green there so there is a, there's a lot more detail as as you zoom in but the key uh, the key, key issue is that you can't everywhere access a lot of groundwater. You can't everywhere drill a borehole and sustain a large amount of irrigation. You've got to be very careful about how you go about finding places to develop groundwater. So the, the obvious question about developing groundwater, if you've got all these huge resources, is how sustainable are these resources and actually if you've got all that storage why worry about sustainability at all if you've got all these groundwater resources why do you need to worry about sustainability well the reason is that if you begin to over abstract groundwater so you're taking out more water than is being replenished water tables the water table will begin to decline and that has a lot of knock-on effects uh, increasing the costs of pumping it has impacts on rivers, on other users, as Alan Nicholl was saying earlier, and on, and on ecosystems. I just want to illustrate it with a, a th an example from uh, Sokoto in northern Niger Nigeria. I've put a picture there uh, taken on one side of the road. Uh, it's a fairly low rainfall area, but it has shallow groundwater. So this is taken the, uh, on the other side of the road, where people are able to put in small boreholes only 10 metres deep, because the water table is very shallow, and they're able to suck out using suction pumps 
suck out some water to do some, some irrigation. And this has got a thriving local economy here. And they're selling quite a lot of uh, produce, making good livelihoods, getting a good return on their investment. Now, five miles away, there's a government scheme to put in large pivot irrigators, like, such as this one. And that, that is taking out 60 litres per second, uh, a huge volume of groundwater here to irrigate maize. Now, it won't take very long for these large-scale abstractions from this government scheme to begin to decline the groundwater level such that it's below uh, where these suction pumps can operate for these other farmers. So although there's a huge volume of groundwater resources in this area, by over-exploiting it and declining the water tables, it has a big knock-on effect for different users. And where these farmers have been farming, it might return to something like this for them. But how do we assess groundwater sustainability? It's, it's quite difficult to assess. And the best way possible is to measure groundwater levels. And here is some work that Richard Taylor uh, put together as part of the, this project for Makatapuru in Tanzania, showing the longest groundwater level we think there is for, for Africa over from the 1950s to the present day, showing that groundwater levels go up and down. And maybe here it's, a, it's over a decadal uh, time scale. And this really shows the value of measuring groundwater levels. Over the whole period, groundwater levels are roughly stable. But if you look at only 10 years of that, you see a great decline. Uh, so measuring groundwater levels is very important to assess the sustainability. Because here, recharge was not happening to the, Africa, uh, to the aquifer every year, but maybe every decade. So measuring water levels over the long term is really what's important, and that's how we assess the sustainability. However, we don't really have that for Africa yet. Uh, there's only very few places where groundwater levels are actually monitored. So there's another way, which is not as good, but another way that we can try and assess the current si situation uh, of groundwater sustainability, and that's from using satellites. And this uh, example here, and the observant among you will see that this is India rather than Africa, but this shows some examples done by Matt Liddell for, for using these satellites for India, which measures terrestrial water sta storage on a monthly basis, but over a huge footprint, 400 by 400 kilometers. So okay, looking at a very sort of large, large area, so a very kind of rough, rough idea. And here this showed, the, uh, the using these satellites, the overexploitation of groundwater in northern India. So we've tried to do something similar for Africa. And I should say this, this, this uh, research is not published yet. It's in peer review, but I should, should stress it's not actually uh, been published. And it's, uh, so that's a, a caveat. But here we've been looking at all the major African basins. Uh, and looking at the groundwater levels and whether they've been declining or not using the satellites. And what we found is that actually there's no groundwater level decline over this regional scale that we can see. But actually, for these two basins, we're actually finding groundwater accumulation. So groundwater levels are actually going up in these, in these two basins. Only a small amount, uh, but actually no evidence that we can find of De declining groundwater levels at the moment. Now, that shouldn't be surprising to us because there hasn't been large-scale abstraction of groundwater yet. But given the recharge that we've had and the conditions we've had over the last decade, there isn't declining groundwater levels. Now, groundwater recharge is complex, and that's the other side of the equation from abstraction. We're going to be discussing a lot about groundwater abstraction for irriga irrigation, but actually, the other side of the equation is groundwater recharge. How quickly will that groundwater be, be replenished? And what we're finding in some research for UPGROW, UPGROW is a program of research funded by DFID and NERC, looking at groundwater. What we're finding is it's very complex, groundwater uh, recharge, and actually may be linked more to the intensity of rainfall rather than absolute rainfall amounts. So if we think about sustainability, we need to understand groundwater recharge processes as well as abstraction and there's a lot more work we need to do as scientists for that. So just moving on to my last couple of slides to some other issues we need to think about for the future for Africa and one is water quality issues. Evidence from everywhere else in the world is that when you start to irrigate you start to have 
water quality issues. Be it salinization that you have in India and Pakistan and China, where uh, waterlogging of soils leads to salinized groundwater and soils, or increased use of fertilizers and pesticides leading towards contamination of the groundwater in nitrate and pesticide. And also the growing urban areas within Africa leading to a lot of problems for groundwater contamination around uh, urban or peri-urban areas. So there are large water quality issues emerging for groundwater <coughs> in Africa and we need to take that into consideration. So what should be our priorities for <coughs> managing these groundwater resources? Well, I would, I would echo what Alan Nichol said at the beginning. We need to map and monitor these groundwater resources, not at a continental scale, but at a country, regional, district level. We need to understand where these groundwater resources are and what the water quality is like. Remember Bangladesh, when so much groundwater was developed without really understanding the, the arsenic uh, issues that were in store there. We need to understand water quality and groundwater resources and monitor them. In managing these groundwater resources, we should identify the vulnerable areas and protect them. We don't have to protect maybe groundwater everywhere, but identify the critical areas which are vulnerable to either contamination or being overexploited and protect them. We should promote best practice in drilling and uh, boreholes where we can and constructing boreholes, learning the knowledge from other parts of the world, making sure these boreholes and wells are constructed well for the future. And also we need to forecast what some of these future impacts will be of large-scale irrigation in some of the areas that are developing irrigation. What, what's going to happen to, to recharge in these areas? What are the different uses that that groundwater be, could be put for? Let's forecast, forecast them. So in summary, I would say groundwater is fundamental to the food security <laughs> in Africa and the development of groundwater is fundamental to that. There are large volumes of groundwater stored in Africa, but they're not always easy to access. There will be a high potential for small-scale development, but actually finding areas where you can put in large pivot irrigators is going to be much more difficult and lead a lot more investment in understanding the resources. And of course, for these groundwater development to be sustainable, and I'd argue that sustainability is, is good because of the, uh, the problems of unsustainable groundwater abstraction then we need to be careful about how we manage these groundwater resources and protect vulnerable areas. And just at the end, saying there is a upgrow is this new program of research from managed by NERC with mostly DFID money, and there will be a lot more research outputs coming in the next sort of five or six years time from this program of research. So to, to look out for them as they come out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Great. Um, and thanks for explaining what is a uh, you know, a complicated and evolving story so, um, so succinctly. Um, now, I think what we're going to do is uh, take perhaps a, a couple of clarifying questions because we're running several keynotes back to back here. Plenty of time a little bit later for a, for a good discussion. But if any of you, uh, while Alan is sitting here, if any of you have got just short, snappy uh, clarifi cl clarification questions, then um, please go ahead. Yes, just tell us tell us who you are, and um, keep it short. Uh, my name is Ian Neal from a small NGO called Excellent Development. Uh, my question is just a bit more detail about uh, the link between rainfall intensity and uh, recharge. What, whether there's any particular new insights which have emerged before you start there Alan um, let's if there are any other questions I'll run them together so let's let's take one more from from you sir just hold on a moment yeah uh, Thomas Salutek independent consultant just a quick question about the uh, special the huge aquifers in the northern Africa and the sustainability issue I understand that most of them actually are uh, non-replenishable uh, sources, they're actually talking about groundwater mining here, aren't we? Yeah. Good, thank you. Tony, was that a half question? I might, uh, I might Can we clarify, you. Tony Allen, um, King's College, can we just clarify, when we're talking about water use, we're talking about water use for food, that's food water, which is 90% of the water, 
a lot of it's green, and uh, non-food water, which is what we did get from the hand pump. So that if we're talking about, and you've mainly, well you've sometimes talked about security as if it's sort of all mixed, it is all mixed up, but we do need to be quite sure when we're talking about water security, we're talking about non-food water security, which is in volume terms quite easy, whereas the food security side is rather vague and it's mainly about green water. Okay, thanks, Tony. We're going to draw a line um, for those three questions. Alan. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks for these questions. Uh, rainfall intensity. Uh, there is emerging research that showing that uh, rainfall intensity is, is linked to, uh, to, to recharge. And uh, the study that I showed you with the, the long groundwater level record from Akatapuru showed that uh, the the decadal recharge events seem to happen or seem to be linked with much more intense rainfall <coughs> events. Now, there's also work that we're doing for UpGrow where we're reviewing groundwater recharge uh, studies across the continent. So we're looking at about 200, 250 recharge studies. And what that seems to suggest is that below a rainfall of about 1,000 millimetres, uh, the link between average annual rainfall and recharge is, is non-linear and there isn't a great <coughs> relationship below about 1,000 millimetres. However, when you delve a little bit deeper into that, you realise that there is a relationship there, but it's linked more to intense rainfall rather than absolute volumes. So I would say that it's emerging research and we would like to do a lot more in this area to try and understand these links because the, the forecasts with, with climate change projections are that rainfall events might get fewer but more intense. And... Uh, some people had said that this would lead to less recharge, but we think that actually it, it might lead to more recharge. So it's, it's an area that needs to be looked into in more detail. I suppose that's, that's linked to the question on the, on the, the northern Africa and uh, aquifers as well. Yes, most of them are, are, are old groundwater, uh, estimated between about five and 10,000 years old, that groundwater, that's when it was recharged. So the large volume of groundwater resources there are, are historic and they're not really being actively recharged at the moment at all. In fact, the groundwater levels, for most of them have declined about 200 metres in the last 5,000 years since they were last replenished, and they've naturally declined as water's flown out through the, through the oases. So yes, that, that, that's something we call fossil water. And, th and then Tony has uh, picked me up on my, my lo loose use of terms. I'm more precise when I talk about my hydrogeological terms, but not when I'm talking about water security. So I think the, the issue here is that uh, there isn't a lot of groundwater used for irrigation across Africa at the moment at all. And, uh, and uh, I think only 5% of Africa is irrigated, as opposed to global of, of about 20%, uh, something along these, these lines. But looking forward and looking at the, the number of people that are, are interested in using groundwater for irrigation, I think that we as hydrogeologists need to to look at groundwater through that lens, not just a, a water security for drinking water and for, for hygienic uses, but for agriculture as well. Great, thank you, Alan. Um, and we will come back to some of these questions, I think, um, later in the day, in the afternoon. Uh, so some of the research um, uh, that Alan presented there on, you know, the links between groundwater and, um, and rainfall averages, intensity and so on, was written up in a paper for Nature Climate Change by Richard Taylor at the back, who's uh, presenting later. So I'm sure he's going to touch on that. Now, um, next up, um, we, we actually have a little piece from um, the State Minister for uh, agriculture in Ethiopia. I'll just um, let Alan maybe say a couple of words about that before we run it, because it was Alan in Ethiopia uh, this last week who, who basically set that up. Um, but um, so it's a it's a it's a it's a pre-recorded uh, piece, but does I think give a nice little insight into the the sort of interest um, that is that we now see in countries like Ethiopia in mobilizing water uh, for irrigation of various, of various styles and in various forms. Um, and as you'll hear, you know, a major program in, in Ethiopia is called the Household Irrigation uh, Program and is about 
liberating or mobilizing water for smallholder farmers. Um, so not commercial agriculture, smallholder farmers. Alan, any anything to add before we run the before we run the, the video? Thanks, Roger. Well, really, just um, to add that the minister was very, very interested in giving this short uh, interview and contribution to this day. And uh, we, unfortunately, to fit it in, we had to edit it down slightly, but the full version will be available online. Um, and I think partly his interest was really the, the fact that this groundwater resource in Ethiopia hitherto hidden away, is now becoming much more accessible and much more understood. Um, and I think probably much more likely to be uh, abstracted at far higher volumes now than it would have been or has been in the last five or ten years. So, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a tipping point. Um, and I think that the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Water are aware of that. And a lot of people working in the sector e in Ethiopia are aware of that. So I think this will be an interesting contribution.